million hours to sell the deal. Um, so today is going to be part two, part three, and part four of this uh, lecture. Uh, I have the tendency to go a bit fast, you know, in the last time, uh, this time, uh, when I really important that I don't go too fast. So if I go too fast, please slow me down. Don't worry about that. I can order everything in the decreasing importance. So if you can't finish everything, it's no problem. Um, so last time I gave you the basics, information theoretic theory, and I gave you just a tiny little glimpse of the neo model selection, how it looks like. Uh, the first section today is going to be all about the neo model selection. So that's what we're going to do now. And I'm going to review a little bit what I did last time. Um, so I'll start the review with this notion of universal code and model, which underlines everything. The notion of optimal universal model is the one of MDL is based on. So, but even before I say repeat what the universal model is, please remember the most important thing for. Namely, probabilities correspond to cobank functions, probability mass functions correspond to cobank functions, and vice versa. So, if I have countable sets like an n fold product space, countable space, center space, I have distribution on that set function which adds to something, adds to one, and it's non-negative for all its, uh, uh, well, all outcomes. And I can construct the code, I said the length of any outcome is minus by the logarithm of the probability of the Also by its first, if I have a uniquely decodable code, defined over all sequences of a given length, I can also come up with a distribution such that for outcomes, this holds small code lengths for larger probabilities by the first. So now, uh, this other important thing, universal codes, universal models. The base value of this. Uh, suppose I have a finite set of candidate codes, which I identify with their code length. The only interested in the length of the code. Now, I get some sample, some data. I want to compress the data as much as possible, where it, I think it's one of the codes in set 30L will give actually pretty good compression of my data. Um, now, the obvious thing to do is simply to compress your data using the code which best fits, which gives the mar largest compression to that particular sequence. But we've seen last time that that doesn't work. If for every sequence of data you simply encode the data using the code that's best for that data, then the resulting procedure cannot be interpreted as a code anymore because the decoder cannot decode it. The decoder doesn't know what code you have used to encode the data because the code you've used depends on the data itself. Decoder doesn't know what to use. So the case where you're dealing with coding was for a given set of candidate codes, you come up with a code which is really a code that's for every uh, encoded sequence. The decoder can always retrieve the original sequence. So come up with a real, a real code such that no matter what data you want to encode, the number of extra bits you need compared to the best code for that particular data sequence is very small. So this number of extra bits is called regrets by decision theorists. And the idea is that we want to come up with a code that no matter what data we get, the number of bits we need with our code, small or equal than the smallest achievable number of bits using any of the candidate codes, except curly L, plus something small. We've <coughs> seen last time that L is curly finite, it's actually very easy to make such a code. And the code will typically, this thing will not increase at n, whereas this typically increases at n linearly for, um, for most sequences. So then, unless we have very small n, for the order of this large n, this thing will be negligible compared to this thing, and our universal code will be effectively about as good as the best code for a particular sequence, no matter what sequence we get. That's the basic idea. And how do we do this? Set query L is finite. Uh, well, one way of doing this is first encoding an index in the set 30 L. So the encoder first encodes what exactly what code is going to use to code the data. So he looks at the data, he says, okay, this in this code is the best. That code has a number, it's an order of all the codes in 30 L. He encodes the number. And then after encoding the number, he codes the data using the code index by the number which he encoded first. Then the decoder can first decode the number. He knows what code the encoder used, and then he codes uh, the actual sequence using the particular code that was used, which is the best code for that sequence. 
So then you have this, see this is the uniform code, the fixed length code, for coding L to 30 L, if you set L as K elements, you can use log K this to code any one of them, and then this is the number of the unit. So we have constant red where this is unit. Now, today uh, I'm going to look also at more interesting cases where the set of reference codes is infinite. And then typically you cannot achieve a finite degree. So you cannot come up with a constant. So no matter what sequence you get, you only need constant number extra, which doesn't depend on the sample size compared to the best thing to that sample size. So, but still typically you can get something very small here, whereas this is linear, for example, this will often be logarithmic. And still a number of bits you need on average for an encoded symbol, the sequence, like n, will go uh, extra number of bits compared to the best thing will go to zero and order log n over n, which is pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So said here the number of codes is actually this number. Uh, why do I say this? The word universal is always referring relative to the given model, relative to the given set of chemical codes. So the universe can be very small, the universe can even be finite. Universal means the code is universal relative to the square L. That's where we're in the first possible. So don't think of it as something which can solve all your compression problems. It's universal relative to the given set. Okay, then universal models are just mappings from universal codes to probability distributions, such that you have this minus log probability correspondence. So a universal model is a distribution. We find out all sequences of length n, such that for all sequences, the number of bits we use with the code of these lengths is more equal than the number of bits used by the code corresponding to the best distribution you set of Canada distributions. So here we have a set of Canada distributions, uh, and this is just the same as on the previous slide, but now we think of these code lengths in terms of corresponding probabilities. And these are code lengths. And now we come up with a new distribution such as minus log of probability, small or equal to the best you can do for a particular sequence. So plus something small. Once again, if m is pretty m is finite, you can achieve, you can construct a universal model by first encoding an index, a particular speed that you're going to use to encode your data. So that means you're going to use the distribution theta map it to a code, it means that code to encode your data. Um, and of course, the distribution in your set of the distribution, which minimizes minus log probability of the data, which minimizes the code length of the code for a quantity distribution, is simply minus log of the probability of the data according to the maximum likelihood estimator for the data. Because the thing which minimizes minus log probability of all theta is the same thing that maximizes the probability of all theta by definition of the maximum likelihood estimator. So universal models are probability distributions um, relative to some given model for all sequences which satisfy this property. Again, you can think of them as both if this set of really is finite, you get finite regret usually, no matter what n is, and it's infinite. And simply the regret you get has to grow with n, no matter what distribution you, you try to devise here. Now for parametric families like the set of Bernini distributions, or set for the Marcus chains, typically the regret you can achieve is finite. This means that there exists some distributions. No, 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 I'm not saying that these distributions generate the data. Not at all. They're artificial constructs. So I can mathematically construct a distribution such as minus log probability, which you can think of as a complex, small or equal to minus log probability according to the best fitting thing for that particular sequence plus something small, and this will typically grow logarithmically in sample size. In a moment, we will see why. Now, then I told you that there are two kinds of universal models, or actually there are quite a few more, but we will account for today, but uh, the first two I talked to you about were the two-part code universal model, where you code data by first encoding an index in a set of candidate codes, or candidate distributions, and then you code the data with the help code corresponding to the index, that's the two-part code. The other one was the Bayesian code, where you uh, use as a universal model the Bayesian mixture according to some prime probability of the data 
give a feed time, wait, a prior wait feed time that stops overall feed time. We've argued in the previous lecture that that also, although it doesn't, it looks not that coding at all, but it gives you a universal model. And in a sense, it was a better universal model than the two-part model. And it says that no matter what sequence you get, if the base is universal model, you need less bits. You never need more bits, and sometimes actually less bits than you need with the two-part code for that particular sequence. So it's uniformly at least as good as two-part code. So that led us to the question of what is the best, how do you define the best universal code? And that's where I want to take off now, or we're going to do everything in detail. So in general, a universal model is something from distribution such that this difference is small no matter what data you get. So for every particular sequence of length n, this is the smallest code length you can get if you code data using the codes corresponding to the distribution, right? It's P that maximizes probability, minimizes my probability. So this depends on the data. We've already seen that there can be no distribution for which this is smaller or equal to zero for all sequences. So there can be no distribution which is always better than the best distribution for that sequence, which makes it really sense. So this has to be positive for some, no matter what distribution you plug in. So now we're going to look for the distribution such that the difference is as small as possible in the worst case. Then look at the worst case of the whole sequence of length like n, of the difference between the number of bits I need, the code for a star, and what could have been obtained in hindsight if I had no sequence in advance using the best fitting thing. So this will be sometimes positive. I take the worst case of all sequences, and then I look for the P star, which minimizes the difference in the worst case. That will be, by definition, our minimax optimal universal model relative to the set of thetas our model. Now, it turns out you can solve for this P star. And the solution actually looks rather easy, even though it's very hard to calculate explicitly. Given by a certain start of distribution, also known as normalized maximum likelihood distribution. So it was introduced by Starkov in a different context. Starkov is a very well known uh, Russian information theorist. It looks like this the probability it assigns to sequence is just the probability that the maximum likelihood distribution assigns to that particular sequence. That's the maximum possible probability among all probabilities in set theory M. Clearly, this thing doesn't sum to one, which is something larger than one, to add it over all sequences. Because as long as there's more than one element in curly M, for different sequences, there will be different distributions maximized. So here you add a maximum of probabilities of different distributions that must be larger than one. So if I only take this, uh, or only take the numerator, I don't get a distribution, so I have to normalize. I simply divide it by the sum of all sequences in a given length. Probability of that sequence according to the maximum likelihood distribution of that sequence. Obviously, if I divide it by this, then I now have a real distribution of the sequence of length n, which sums to one of all possible sequences. Uh, now, why does this thing solve this minimax equation? Well, if you plug it in, you see you get here, this is a fraction, so you get minus log of the numerator plus log of the denominator. So the minus log of the numerator cancels in this term. The only thing that remains here is plus log of this enormous sum. Now this sum doesn't depend on the x's here, right? It's the sum of the difference sequences, of the y sequences. So if you plug this in here, you get something which is constant over all different sequences. So you have a constant here. It um, doesn't depend on the x. Now suppose I would plug in any different distribution here. Right? I could try any distribution I want. Because for any two probability distributions, it must be the case but for at least one sequence, one distribution gives a higher probability than the other. For at least one sequence, one distribution gives a lower probability than the other. Otherwise, they wouldn't be the same distributions, right? Now, because this must be the case for any two different distributions, if I would plug in any other distribution here, there must be some sequence for which the value I get here is um, uh, the probability is smaller, and hence the value I get here is larger than its constant. Here it's a constant, and for the other sequence, for any other distribution, it must depend on the x values. And that shows that 
for any other distribution, the worst case of all axis must be larger than the quadratic sphere. Cut this in here. And that's why this solves this. So a lot of modern you know, description language is based really on normalized maximum likelihood, normalized maximum likelihood distribution. How does it work? So suppose I'm given a set of data. Now I'm going to do model selection. So between a finite set of models. So I want to uh, decide, let's say, between the very distributions distribution, so the first order market distributions, or something similar. Um, then MDL tells us to pick the models so that would be either very new or first order market model. You could also think about first order polynomials and Gaussian or second order polynomials and Gaussian. It tells you to pick the model for which the associated normalized maximum likelihood distribution gives the largest probability to the data. So rather than maximum likelihood model selection, you do normalized maximum likelihood model selection. You pick the model such so that this probability is maximized. Equivalently, if you think of it as a state, really it's better to think of it as a code rather than a distribution. You can think of this as you construct the code depending on all the distribution of the model m sub i. Now we took the model such that the number of bits needed to encode the data using this universal code corresponding to the model. So, anyway, so you pick the model that the associated code minimizes the number of bits needed to encode the data, where the code is defined by the start of the distribution. Now, so we've seen this distribution looks like this. If you take logarithm of that, you get log probability data according to maximum likelihood um, plus log of the sum. So minimizing this min minus log is equivalent to picking a model which minimizes minus log of the numerator plus log of the denominator. And this now looks like a more familiar thing in the uh, some trade off between the error the model makes the data, plus the complexity of the model. Now, this is, if you think of probabilistic terms, not so strange to think of this as an error. This is for every model under consideration, simply how well the best distribution in that model fits the particular data you have, where fit is measured by log likelihood. Right? The higher the log likelihood, according to maximum likelihood, the smaller this term, the smaller the error. Now, this can be thought of as something like a complexity term. And in a moment, we will, uh, we will see why. Um, well, let me first give you first idea of what like, could be something like a complexity term. If you compare two models, think of finite models for the moment. So for example, you take the very new distribution, by some points, discretize to some precision, so that you just have 10 of them. Probably these 1, 0, 1, probably these 1, 0, 1, 2. Etc. When you have a model of n distributions, you do the same thing for the first order market chains. So then you will get a model of common distribution, which is two parameters which are also discretized to precision 0.1. So then one model has 10 different distributions, and the other 100, 100. Now if you look at this sum, you sum up all the sequences, how much fits the best thing in the model can assign to that sequence. So if you have many different distributions, like the first uh, order Markov case compared to the new case, there will be many more sequences for which the maximum likelihood estimator can assign a large probability. So the sum of all sequences of this thing will actually get larger. Uh, if you have just one distribution in your model, then the sum of all sequences of this thing is just one. So that the complexity term is zero. If you have, let's say, the nth order Markov case, then for every sequence, there is a distribution in your model which gives probability 1 to that sequence. Now in that case, this complexity term will be log 2 to the power n, because there are 2 to the power n binary sequences of length n. And then the complexity term is n. So it's something between 1 and n. And the more distributions you have, the more factors you can fit well the maximum likelihood for that term, the larger the term. So from the intuitive point of view, it does matter something like how many patterns you can fit well. That must be related to complexity. If you can fit many patterns well, you want a large risk of overfit. Because right. it's easy to fit one. So this is the simplest form of uh, minimum description and model selection. Later I'll go into more extensive forms. So 
just remember this is just about one section of two simple models. It's not general story of MEL. It's much more to come. Now, I'm going to give you four interpretations of picking the model, which minimizes the minus log probability according to this normalized maximum likelihood distribution, equivalently, which picks the model minimizing this trade off between fit and complexity. In the hope that if I give you four different interpretations, you will agree with me that it can be a reasonable thing to do in practice. So, first, the compression implication. And then I've implicitly already given. So, remember that Rissner's original idea for introducing MDL was the idea that regularity can be equated with compression. If you have a regular sequence, you can, uh, and it's a regularity you can see with your model then you, you can somehow compress that sequence. If the sequence is incompressible, it must be ready. So then, Rissner's idea was to naively translate it that would, would then become, if you want to do statistics based on that, you should pick the model which allows you to most compress your data. That is the model which can see the most regularity in your data. Now, of course, the model doesn't readily define a way of coding data. Right? The model is a set of distributions. It is not something that you can code through your data. So what happened here is that you associate with each possible model we contemplate a distribution and associate with the distribution of code. And then we say compression using the data using a model is compression with that code associated with the model. Now, whether or not this makes sense, now of course, crucially depends on how we want to associate models with codes. And what we did here is that we associated a statistical model set of distributions with the particular code that whatever sum distribution and set of distributions fits the data well, it's a short code of your data. So if you can fit the data well, you compress the data a lot. However, there is no code which will always compress as much as the best thing for the data. But you try to make the code which has the extra number of bits compared to the best distribution for the data you have should be as small as possible in the worst case of all sequences. So no matter what distribution in your model best fits the data, the extra number of bits compared to that optimal distribution, you need to code the data. It's constant. So you treat all the distributions on equal footing. You have a code associated with the model that treats everything in the model in the same way. By different distributions, if they fit the data equally well, then this would amount to using the same code length for your data. So you coded the data in this particular way, and then MDL tells you to pick the model for which the code length of the data uh, relative to the model is minimized. That's the compression implementation. But that is, of course, uh, very informal, so we would like to see some more. I hope to say more about why this would make sense to you. So that's the second interpretation, the counting interpretation. Um, I've already told you that for intuitive point of view, this is something like the total fit the model that you see data. Some of all sequences, how well you can fit that sequence using the length of the sequence. So intuitively, it's something like complexity. Um, but you can be more precise about that. First of all, note that if we have a finite model, we'll go to infinite realistic model at the moment. It's again supposed it's finite, so let's say it says four distributions in it. And we know that this term must be smaller equal to log 4. Why is it so? Well, this is the code length for your data according to some universal model. It's the minimax optimal universal model. And we've already seen that there's another universal model, a two part universal model, which codes, would code the data by first encoding an index of the particular distribution of the model you use. And if you have four distributions in your model, it takes two bits. And then you encode the data using a particular distribution. So you would use the two-part model to encode data, and for all sequences, you would use this thing plus log of four, which is two, log of the number of elements in the model, right? So, but because this thing tries to be as close as, this code tries to be as close as possible to this for all sequences, and must for all sequences be at least as close as the two-part code for that sequence, which is log number of elements. So this thing is smaller or equal than log of the number of elements in the model. The model is finite. You could think of this as somehow counting how many models there are. 
how many distributions there are in the model, more distributions, more complexity. However, it's not executive because it's so not equal. So how large is this exactly? Well, we're going to look at that now. Four finite models, again, infinite models. So suppose I have a finite set of distributions. And now forget about the log, I just look at the sum. So the sum is of all sequences relative to dates according to maximum ID. I'm going to decompose that sum into two parts. So first I'm going to sum over all theta in my model, which I can do because it's a finite number, I just said. Now I'm going to sum over all sequences for which this particular theta is the maximum ID. Then I sum again over this probability. Clearly, this sum is the same as this. Here I just decompose, I make basically a partition of the set of sequences in like n into the set of sequences, into the sets corresponding to different maximum likelihood estimators. And if I have four distributions, I will have four different sets, each set corresponding to the sequences for which that distribution is maximum likelihood. Same. Thing. So now I can rewrite the second term. It's a sum over a lot of sequences, so it's an event. And we write that as a probability that you get some sequence for which the maximum likelihood estimator is theta according to distribution theta. So this is not going to be the same as this. The first sum has been retained. And this sum has been rewritten like this. Probability of all sequences for which the maximum likelihood estimator is theta. Now the trick comes. The probability that I get a sequence for which the maximum likelihood estimator is theta so one minus the probability that I get the sequence for which the maximum likelihood estimator is not the theta that generates the data. So this is one minus the probability of getting a sequence, such that the best fitting thing for that sequence is not equal to the thing that generates the sequence. I can pull the one out of the sum, and then this becomes simply the number, because I sum of all theta, it becomes the number of elements involved. So it's the number of distributions. And then I get minus something. So this is in accordance with what we've seen before. The sum is always smaller or equal than m, the number of distributions. And there is some amount by which it's smaller, and that amount is something I like to call the total amount of confusion in your model at the given sample size. So why do I call it confusion? If you look at one element of the sum, it's the probability according to some theta that you get data which doesn't look as if it comes from theta. It looks as if it comes from some other distribution in your model. So it's basically the probability according to theta that you get a sequence which you are likely to confuse for something which is not theta. You sum that over all theta. So it's kind of what is the total amount of according to all theta getting a sequence which you would confuse not for something which is not the thing which is created. Uh, now, if data are IID and also much more generally, because this sum is finite, this typically goes down exponentially in n. You can show that by Cherov or anything about just by the law of large numbers, typically the probability that, for example, if you have very distribution, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, if 0 0.2 generates the data, and with incredibly high probability, frequency of ones will converge to 0 0.2. So then the maximum likelihood estimator will be 0 0.2, not 0 0.4 or any of the other ones. So the exponentially small probability for the frequency of ones is such that the data is such that the maximum likelihood estimator is not in general today. So it's a sum of things which go exponentially down. So for large sample size, it's about zero. And for large sample size, then the complexity measured in this way is simply the number of elements in your, uh, your model, number of distribution. Uh, but for small sequences, uh, short sequences are different because then the amount of confusion can be much larger. Then you just get one outcome. Probability is actually very large. And if probability 0.2 generates the outcome, if the outcome is 1, you will say that the maximum likelihood estimator is 1, the highest number you allow in yourself. Not 0.2. So that is probability is actually pretty large. And what this means is that effective complexity is smaller. So effectively, small sample size, most of the distributions in your model are so similar to each other that you can't tell them apart. So it's, you can't, you shouldn't count them separately. You should count them only partially. Let's see if you make sure. So this is the 
account interpretation of finite uh, models. So now we finally go to more realistic models, like set of first order Markov distributions, set of all the models, parametric model classes. Um, and it turns out that then you can have analog of this count interpretation. I'll go to that in a moment. So for parametric model classes, it turns out that under regularity conditions, you can do an asymptotic uh, approximation to the thing that is minimized, that MDL wants you to minimize, minus not fully the data for it to normalize maximum life. So recall, the finite set of models, MDL wants you to pick the model which minimizes the sinus law. So you minimize over a set of different early M. Now for each fixed M, you can rewrite this as follows. First term is familiar. This is just this minus log of fraction. So this is the uh, numerator. This is the log of the denominator. So we only rewrite this enormous sum here, the log of the sum of all sequences. For really good data in the sequence. Uh, and so that asymptotically looks as follows. Uh, it is two important terms. One grows logarithmically in n. So there's a big difference here compared to the finite models where this complexity term was finite, not grown with them. Here, if you take the minimax universal model, because we have an uh, uh, infinitude of distributions, like a set of all bare distributions, which is equivalent to the unit of the process, an uncomfortable unit set, we get our minimax optimal universal model means, means on the order of logarithm and extra bits compared to the best fit of the The problem is still pretty small because this thing could be go linear. So you have a fit term which is linear, then this term decomposes into a logarithmic term, and a term which does not grow sample size. But it depends very it can vary much wildly among different models. And then there's a term which is small order of one, so it means that it goes to zero and the sample size goes to infinity. So what do the symbols mean? The K stands for intuitively the number of dimensions of the model, the number of three parameters. So this is of course, you have to be very precise in how to define this, because you can always embed a model of something of a higher dimension, but it turns out that there is something kind of like canonical parameterization for most regular statistical models, and that's the degree of speed we get there. Um, then this I of theta is the Fisher information agency of theta. Um, this morning we've seen the John Francois talk the definition of it, but Actually, definition is not going to be very important for yourself. So if you don't know this, don't worry about it. And I'll give you an interpretation of what it does. What it does, it doesn't be up here. Um, now, also I should say, so why does this hold? It certainly doesn't hold for any type of model. But it does typically hold for the kind of models that statisticians like to use. It holds for all exponential families. So that includes also recursive exponential families like the Markov model, the new model. Normal distributions, exponential distributions, uh, Poisson distribution, Gamma distribution, what have you. Uh, it also holds for more complicated things like mixtures. Uh, so it holds for everything that uh, for all curve exponential time or something. But it holds pretty well, widely. So what's going on here? This term goes logarithmically and uh, it depends on the parameters. So the more the parameters your model has, the larger its complexity measure in this way. This term depends on the curvature of your model. What that is, we'll see in a moment. Um, it, it does not depend on the number of parameters. <laughs> now, if you look at this, and suppose you want to do a real model selection, but you don't get the computational resources to compute it directly. We call that it involves computing an exponential yard sum. So, the first approximation you might try to take the model which minimizes this asymptotic version. Now, if you would do that, you would compare that to older model selection criteria, like the basic DIC criteria, or the very first version of MDL, both from 1968. The data device is to pick the model that minimizes minus log probability of the data according to the maximum likelihood within that model, plus number of parameters divided by two log n. So, the same except for this last term, which 
does not grow with n. That shows that for very large n, if the first term grows linearly, for very large n, these old things tell you to do the same as new MDL. But for most reasonable sample sizes, this third term can really be very large, and they may give completely different results. Now, what does third term stand for? It measures something like part of the complexity of your model induced by the model equation by how the parameters map to distributions and intuitively the space of all distributions of your sample state. So this can be very different for different models, and that's not so strange, because as is well known, also intuitively, the complexity of a model, how many patterns it can fit well, is not only related to the number of parameters in the model. To give an example of that, it's kind of a somewhat demagogic example, but uh, it will serve its purpose. Well, I guess. Uh, think of the first order mark of models for binary sequences. So they have two parameters. Probability of one given the three to bit was one. Probability of one given the three to bit was zero. So you can think of the parameter space as a square, a unit square. So this would then be the square corresponding to the first order mark of distribution. Now, the Bernoulli models, Bernoulli model, each Bernoulli distribution is also a first order mark of distribution, but the probability of a 1 given a 1 is the probability of a 1 given a 0. So this means that the Bernoulli distributions are just a diagonal line in the square. It's a one-dimensional subnet model. So here you have a two-dimensional model, one-dimensional submodel, which obviously has lower complexity because it's a subset of the two-dimensional model. So now you could think of another model, which you could call the crazy Bernoulli model or something, which is also a one-dimensional sub-model two-dimensional model, but it looks like this. And if I make, this is a sinus, so if I make the period smaller, I can actually make sure that for every distribution in my second, uh, in my two-dimensional model, there is extremely close a distribution in this spatially <coughs> curved one-dimensional model. So clearly I can parameterize this by one dimension, just like this. But it would be silly to assign the same complexity to this thing to this thing. In fact, for small sample sizes, this model will be more like the first order mark model, much more than the way to model. So then for this model you would expect that it really happens, this term to be above large. If you want to do this correctly, you shouldn't do this in Euclidean space, but it's a third version of it. The idea remains the same. But the third term measures in a way, if you think of the model as a manifold, how it is curved. So that's what happens. Now, there's a physicist who in 1998 actually managed to interpret <laughs> these latter two terms in terms of differential geometry. And that was actually a kind of extension of this counting interpretation I did for finite models. He does something like that for instance the model, where he shows that in a sense you can in a sense you can think of this term as counting the number of effectively distinguishable distributions at a given sample size. Because as you get more data, you get more information, the number of effectively distinguishable distribution, distributions increases. That's why this increases for both of the data pattern. So I was going to say, so to you more abstractly, and maybe more and somewhat sexier, you can think as this length term, somehow as the volume that the model takes think of it as a manifold that is based on all this But I don't know anything about that, and I don't really understand it, so I'm not going to say anything more about it, if you want to read it, read it, it's a very good, albeit very hard to read. Um, so really, uh, if you think about it, if you pick the model minimizing this, you don't just pick the next likelihood distribution, which would amount to a generalized likelihood ratio test, which is what statisticians have done for a long time. But you normalize the maximum likelihood somehow by the volume of the model you're considering. So this is the second interpretation, counting geometric interpretation. So the third interpretation is the basin interpretation. So recall that we define the basin universal model, which is one of our now three universal models that you see. Looks like this. Here the parametric family. The integral of all parameters, the probability of the data, the parameter weighted by some prior uh, 
density of the parameter of the Now what we the base we need is model selection, all that several things based on the one of the typical approaches, <coughs> so-called base vector approach, that is if you have two models and one and three, you want to select between the three data you pick, the model which is the highest posterior of probability given your data. How do you compute this probability? Well, you use base rule. And base, so you first assign a prior to the two models. It's kind of a meta prior. So if you have two models simply based on the take probability one half for each of them. So then this becomes one half for both models. <coughs> then the probability of the data given the model is just this probability. So that's marginal likelihood. Integrated is likelihood. Then to make this a distribution of sum over all models sum of the terms. It's just for normalization. So because this thing doesn't depend on the model index i, really you pick the model maximizing this. If this prior is constant over all models, it means that you pick the model that's at the base and marginal likelihood of the data given the model maximum. So the base tells you that you are required to pick this model for your data. Now how does that compare to MDL? You might expect that it's similar to MDL because now you pick the model, maximize the probability, minimize the minus model probability. And it's another universal model, just as this normal exponential likely model. So it might give you something similar, and it actually does. So we've seen this as a public expansion for normal exponential likelihood. Now, under very similar regularity conditions, it turns out that the base marginal likelihood given the model can be rewritten as this. It's also minus model probability evaluated at the maximum likelihood point, plus k of 2 log n. Then you get different terms, and this term depends on the prior. So you get minus log the prior density of the maximum likelihood point. So if the data is such that the maximum likelihood point has a high prior, it's kind of a happy situation for you because your prior is very favorable to the data you actually got. But then this term is small. If you get a small prior to what turns out to be maximum likelihood, you need more bits to encode your data. The prior was bad for the actual data you got. So this depends on the prior, and then this thing again depends on the Fisher information. Evaluated at the next slide. If these terms typically don't uh, grow with n, they're bounded by some constant. So for large enough n, but this also does grow with n, this and this will give you the same outcome. So for very large n, base and MDL will be the same because these terms do grow with n. Right? But that has to be very large n. You, you yeah. say infer. But only in tasks which uh, in the part which make the modern MDL more interesting than the other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the old part, yeah. they don't differ. They're really the same. So, but now there exists a particular prior which is called Jeffrey's prior, and it looks like this: for every theta, the prior density is the determinant of the Fisher information. Theta. If you integrate this, theta, you get some activity which doesn't integrate to 1. To make it a real density, you get to normalize, divided by the integral of well theta of this expression, square root determinant of theta. Now, if you take this prior, which has been very well known based on statistics, and plug it in here, you see that you get minus log of this term at the maximum likelihood point plus log of this term at the maximum point. It cancels the log of this integral here, and then the two terms the two things become the same, green and small overall. So then asymptotically, it's still only asymptotically, but asymptotically, they're exactly the same, because the small one above goes to zero. Now, interestingly, this Jeffrey's prior has been proposed as a non conformal basis prior by Jeffrey's as early as 1939. And one of the reasons for that was that um, uh, it doesn't depend on the parameterization of your model. So if you parameterize a model in different ways, still have the same model. But what is uniform in one parameterization can be highly non-uniform in different parameterization. So what is usually called the uniform prior is actually not uniform in any meaningful sense because it depends on an arbitrary, an arbitrary continuous method of parameter space to another space, it's not uniform anymore. But Jeffrey's prior is something like a uniform prior, not on a parameter space, but on a space of distributions. Now what that means I'll tell you after. So, it's great. <laughs>